Hello, this is Brian Auten of Apologetics 315. Today's interview is with David Glass. David has a Ph.D. in theoretical physics and an M.A. in philosophy from Queen's University, Belfast, and teaches at the University of Ulster. His interest lies in the relationship between science and Christianity and in how evidence should be used in debates about the existence of God. He is author of the recently released book entitled Atheism's New Clothes, Exploring and Exposing the Claims of the New Atheists. The purpose of this interview is to explore some of the ideas in David's book, examine atheism today, and how Christians can interact with atheists. Well, thanks for speaking with me today, David. Oh, great to be with you, Brian. Thanks for having me. Well, David, this is a special interview for me because it happens to be the first one done entirely in Northern Ireland. Oh, really? Oh, very good. <laughs> yes. Uh, now, our listeners should know uh, a bit about it, about you as we begin. And I must say that when people in Northern Ireland have talked to me and somehow they find out that uh, I'm into apologetics, they and they know a little bit about that subject, they always ask me, oh, have you met David Glass? <laughs> and <laughs> so, indeed, we have finally met at uh, yes. Reasonable Faith in Belfast and maybe another uh, meeting here or there. But um, yeah. fill our listeners in a bit. What's your background and what's your area of interest? Okay. Um, well, I, I grew up just outside Armagh in, in Northern Ireland and have lived here all my life. So I, I was raised in a, a Christian family, and I suppose it was later on in my teenage years that I started to think about some of the kinds of issues that we're talking about. I had quite a lot of questions, especially, I suppose, because there were two big influences on my life at that stage. One was my Christian faith, and the other was my interest in science. So I, I had a lot of questions about how these fitted together. I went to university to study mathematics and then went on to do theoretical physics uh, afterwards, research in that area. Um, through this time, I was thinking a lot in my spare time, I suppose, about some of these questions still. And at this time, it was people like C.S. Lewis and Francis Schaeffer and others who had a, a big influence on me. Um, I was also interested in philosophy of science. And so when I was, was working in research, I took on the, the task of uh, studying for a master's in philosophy, and that gave me a bit more of a taste for that kind of thing. Around, around this time, I, I met Kathy, who was later to become my wife, and uh, we now live in Green Island, just a bit outside Belfast, uh, with our, our five kids. And at present, I, I work at the University of Ulster, where I, I work in computing, and my research is really on areas of the relation, uh, the interface between computing and philosophy of science. So I use probability theory, for example, to try to make sense of notions such as explanation and evidence. That would be one of the main areas of my work. Hmm. Well, you've got a great background there in both, you know, as you mentioned, theoretical physics and philosophy. So I, I think when I think of that, I think that's a handy combination for addressing this whole faith science relationship. So how do you think most people perceive the faith science issue? Well, I, I think a lot of people perceive a conflict, as indeed I did, I suppose, when I was a student. Um, I think that's one attitude that people have to, towards it. Another is to look at science and faith as being completely separate. So some people will think, well, science, that's about reason and evidence on the one hand, whereas religious belief, well, that's about faith and, and that has nothing to do with uh, science and evidence and so forth on, on the other. The two are completely separate. Now, And I suppose it was both of these ideas that I wasn't happy with, uh, I wanted to, to see was there some way of, of integrating the, the two, did they fit together? So a lot of people see this conflict between science and Christianity where you see a coherence. So why and where are people getting it wrong when they say there's a conflict, do you think? Well, that's a good question. Uh, yeah, I mean, from my own point of view, I, I do see a coherence to a large extent between the two. I, I suppose when I looked into this myself, the conclusion that I came to was that science provides some of the best reasons for belief in God rather than undermining it in any way. I think one reason for, for thinking that there's a, a conflict is 
especially in Christian circles, is that perhaps we sometimes get so focused on, on exactly how we should interpret the first chapters of Genesis or, or something like that, that we, we perceive a, a real conflict here. And one of the things for me, I suppose, was to step back a little bit from those kinds of questions and say, well, let's look at the bigger question. Does science point to an intelligence behind the universe, a creator behind the universe, or does it undermine that idea? And I think when you look at those bigger questions, when you look at the evidence for the beginning of the universe, the fine tuning of the universe, and a whole range of other factors, I, I came to the opposite conclusion that, in fact, there was plenty of reason here for believing in God. Um, one other thing, I, I suppose, sometimes in the media, there's the impression given that there's this ongoing conflict between science and religion. But I think historians of science have just shown that this is completely mistaken. Uh, the history of science doesn't really back this up at all. That's not to say there are no issues of conflict there, but by and large, almost the opposite has been the case, where belief in God has provided one of the foundations for doing science. Mm. Yeah, interesting point there. And Now, dealing with atheism, the new atheists are going to be the first, maybe some of the first to say, uh, here's a conflict between science and faith. It's completely at odds. But you've written a, uh, a new book, and it's entitled Atheism's New Clothes, Exploring and Exposing the Claims of the New Atheists. So I want to ask you questions about this book. Um, and first I'll ask the hard question, which I imagine maybe some might be wondering. And that's, what? Another book about the new atheists. Why do we need an, another one? But, you know, as I read it, I found out the answer quite quickly. But could you explain and kind of expand on that answer? Well, that, that's a very good question, and it's one that I ask myself a lot of times yeah. <laughs> when I was writing it. Uh, it took me quite a long time, and as I was doing so, I discovered quite a lot of other books being published on the subject. Um, where does where does mine fit in? Well, I, I suppose when I, I look at... A, many of the books that have been written. Um, some are theological in nature, whereas mine would be more philosophical, I suppose. Some focus just on science or just on God's existence, but not in revelation, whereas I try to, to cover uh, revelation, the central claims of Christianity as well. Uh, so I, I suppose those are some of the, the differences, but I, I think perhaps the main one, perhaps relates to going back to my student days. When I started to look into some of these kinds of issues, I was fortunate enough to come across a, a number of people who knew a lot more about any of this than I did, and they pointed me to, to some very helpful material. I came across um, the books of people like Richard Swinburne, Alvin Plantinga, William Lane Craig, and, and many others, um, people I refer to as the new theists. So what I've tried to do is to take some of that material that I have benefited from so much and to try to use that material, the new theism, to respond to the new atheism. Well, the difference that I saw in it is that, it, as you said, it, it does uh, address a, a wide variety of issues, but also just doesn't answer them from, from one angle. But it, it answers them from multiple angles and really builds a positive case for Christianity uh, in its place. But here's another starter question that might be pretty obvious. Why the title Atheism's New Clothes? Well, it, it is, as you might have guessed, based on the fable of the emperor's new clothes. Uh, one of the criticisms that's leveled against the new atheists is that they haven't done their homework. They criticize Christian theology, but they haven't actually bothered to find out what the theologians actually say. The response to this criticism is to say that theology is like the emperor from the fable, and the new atheists are like the, the little boy who points out that the emperor is no clothes. And just as the little boy didn't need to be an expert in the latest trends in fashion, to see that the emperor is new clothes, so the new atheists would claim they don't need to be experts in theology to point out that theology has no clothes. Now, this is a, a wonderful piece of rhetoric, but of course, as an argument, it's ho hopeless. Basically, it amounts to saying that it's obvious that there's no God, and that just isn't obvious at all. I mean, most people have thought about these kinds of issues seriously, don't think it's obvious that there's no God. Maybe they've looked at arguments and presented reasons. Uh, and of course, the new atheists 
do some of that as well, but they can't just claim it's, it's obvious. And indeed, when you look at their arguments, I suppose what I'm trying to show is that it's really the new atheists themselves who have no clothes. Where do you see the new atheism today? I mean, do you see it to be still on the rise? Is it receding? I, I think it's having a, an influence at a popular level. Uh, I, I think if you were to look perhaps at the the sort of objections that they've raised to belief in, in God and look at what philosophers of religion, especially atheist philosophers of religion, would have to say, many of them would distance themselves from the, the new atheists. And indeed, some atheists would be embarrassed by the sort of arguments that they've presented. Michael Roos would be an example of this. But at a popular level, I think their arguments are having a big impact. Uh, if you go on to online discussions, you will find that the, the views of the new atheists are, are very popular indeed. And, and perhaps people are more outspoken in defense of their atheism as a result of this. So even if their influence at an academic level isn't as great as, as it might have been, I, I think we, we still need to to know from a Christian point of view exactly why we think their their views are mistaken and try to, to point that out as clearly as we can. Mm hmm. All right. Well, so we've talked about sort of your goal in, in writing the book and and a little bit a little bit about what makes it different. And I want to ask you some more particular questions here. But you know, when I look at books and see what topics they address, I, I tend to categorize them in my mind. And uh, maybe in the category of books on atheism, I have in my mind this list of top three <laughs> with you know in and. When it comes to these atheism books, I have one that's really firmly embedded in the number one position, and I have to honestly say this one is a serious contender for the number one position, okay. <laughs> dealing, with, dealing with the new atheism for me. And one of the reasons that I like this book is that, as I said, it deals with this wide variety of topics, really digs down into what the new atheists argue, it fairly represents them, and then it shows where their arguments fall short and builds this positive case for the Christian view. So can you talk a bit about the structure and the, thing, the things – that you address in countering the new atheist arguments? Well, thanks for your comments. First of all, I hope other people <laughs> hope other people share them as well. Um, early on in the book, I look at a couple of topics that I, I think shape a lot of the, the views held by the new atheists. One of these is their view of faith. Basically, the new atheists consider faith to be believing something for which there's no evidence and in, in their view this is just irrational so if faith is more or less defined as being irrational well then there's really not much point considering it uh, if you want to form your beliefs on, on a rational basis uh, and faith is an irrational way to go then you may as well just forget it I think this influences their views in a number of ways and one of the difficulties of course is that this is just not the view of, of most Christians. I, th I think one of the things here is that there are a range of views that Christians have on the nature of faith, and I, I try to spell some of those out and, and how faith relates to reason, but I, I don't think anybody would really want to defend the kind of view that the new atheists uh, articulate of faith being simply belief without evidence. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's one uh one central idea, I think, of the new atheists that I try to counter. The other we've already talked about a little bit is that science undermines belief in God and, and Christian belief. Uh, so I, I devote a chapter to, to looking at, at why I think that isn't the case. Uh, then I go on to present a number of, of different reasons for belief in God. And I, I look at evidence from the beginning of the universe, the order and the laws of uh, science, the fine tuning of, of the physical laws uh, and consciousness, for example. So uh, amongst other ideas that crop up elsewhere in the book, those are some of the reasons that I give for belief in God. Chapter six, then, is where I focus on Richard Dawkins' argument that God almost certainly doesn't exist. Now, Given my interest in probability, I couldn't really let this one go um, <laughs> for him to claim that, that it's highly improbable that there's a God. And I think he makes some serious mistakes in terms of how he handles probability and, and how that argument goes. So I devote a chapter to that. 
Then I, I look at evolutionary explanations for the origins of religion. Uh, I look at morality, the problem of evil a little bit as well. And towards the end then, in, in the last few chapters, I, I turn to the topic of revelation. I think one of the things about the new atheism is that although they don't have much time for belief in God, they reserve a particular contempt for revelation and for the, the claims of Christianity. And so I, I wanted to have a, a good look at that. And I, I try to present a, a case for the, the resurrection. There's been some great work done on this topic by other people in recent years, and I try to draw on, on some of that material as well. And then I, I finish up by looking at the whole question of meaning, because I, I think this is extremely important. This is not just a, an intellectual debate. This is about the very purpose of our lives, what we're here for, what it's all about. And I think this is a really important Topic, And yet I, I think the new atheists have no resources to address this question at all. So that gives a little bit of an idea, I suppose, of the, the structure of the book. And I suppose one of the things I'm trying to do is is get behind some of the rhetoric of the new atheists and to try to take their arguments seriously. Well, yeah, a really fair treatment. And I'm glad that you've kind of outlined the contents because... I mean, basically, this is a, uh, can stand alone as an apologetics uh, textbook for sort of uh, the beginner, you know, to, to get a real wide landscape uh, of good apologetic responses and a positive case for Christianity. So uh, now of these topics that you've covered here, uh, do you think they're, you know, these are all things that the new atheists have raised, but do you, have you found any one of these to be maybe more crucial uh, in facing our culture today? Well, I think one of the big questions today in the modern world is about the, the place that there is for religious belief, if any. I, I think one of the agendas of the new atheists is to marginalise religious belief from the public sphere, if you like. Uh, and so I think the whole question of the rationality of religious belief is extremely important in this context. The, the new atheists would like to be in a position where Christian beliefs are, are considered to be on a par with the tooth fairy, for example, just beliefs that, that can't be taken seriously by any rational person. And if they could get society, if you like, to move in that direction, that I think would be one of their, their goals. I think for this reason, responding to them is extremely important because if society does move in that direction, then I, I think the Christian message doesn't get a hearing. It just isn't on the radar for people in society if religious beliefs have become so marginalized. And uh, of course, for, for those of us who are Christians, when we think about how important the Christian message is, this really would be a, a disaster. And so I, I think I think that's one of the reasons why addressing these kinds of questions is so important. Mm -hmm. Well, let's look at this subject you address in Chapter 7, Evolution and the Origins of Religion. Um, now, Dawkins and others in the New Atheist camp would want to just write off religion, uh, accounting for it through some evolutionary explanation. So can you elaborate on that atheist position? Well, I'll, I'll try to give a, a brief summary of the, the kinds of ideas that are involved here. Uh, Dennett and Dawkins both provide uh, accounts of the origins of religious belief. Dennett's entire book, Breaking the Spell, is really focused on, on this very topic. And what he tries to argue is that the spell should be broken in the sense that science should be permitted to explain the origins of religion. And so he tries to do that. And what I'll do is spell out a, a few pointers along the way on uh, in terms of his argument. He starts off by looking at the idea of animals, certain animals having a mechanism to detect agents. And so you can imagine that in an evolutionary scenario, our ancient ancestors had a mechanism to detect predators, for example. And of course, if we have a mechanism like this that enables us to detect predators and to flee from them, then this could have had an evolutionary benefit. His idea is that sometimes this mechanism would overshoot. And so an agent would be detected even when there's none there. So we could imagine a scenario where the, the wind's blowing in the trees and an agent is detected 
by the movement of the leaves, but there's no agent there at all. He then goes on from that to speculate that perhaps what happened was that when somebody close to one of our ancestors died, then they, this agent mechanism kicked in and they continued to detect something like the unseen spirit of the person after the person had died. Once we've got these ideas floating about of unseen spirits and so forth, he, he then appeals to the idea of memes. And memes are basically the cultural equivalent of genes. So there are these ideas about different kinds of spirits. And some of these ideas catch on, some some don't. The better ones last for longer in a sort of evolutionary scenario. And these Better ideas, the ones that survive, end up giving rise to ideas like gods that help us to make decisions. And again, this, Dennett claims, could have been beneficial from an evolutionary point of view in certain ways. And once we've got gods, well, then the next step is the sort of domestication of these ideas where people tailor these ideas. They include mysteries to make them immune from disconfirmation and so forth. And... With this change taking place, we get to something like the origins of of some of the main religions. Um, okay, that's a very brief sketch, but that's that's the kind of idea that um, Daniel Dennett presents. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, does that view actually accomplish what they want to accomplish? I mean, does it actually undermine belief? Well, I think there are a number of questions that we need to ask about that. One of the first ones is, well, how well does it actually account for the evidence? Um, Does it really account for the origins of religious belief? And even if it, it does give some sort of explanation, then we have to ask, is it true? And I think one important point that I'd want to make here is when we consider the idea, not just in the context of the origins of religion, but more generally of when a a scientific explanation can remove the need for God or explain away religious belief, then it's not enough just to give a a possible sort of scientific account um, and assume that God is no longer needed. We'd need to at least have some reason for believing that it's a true explanation. And it's very difficult to, to see how we could be convinced that the kind of account that Dennett and Dawkins provide is true. Uh, There's a lot of speculation in there. Some of it seems more plausible than than other parts. But but what really is the evidence for the truth of this? And I I just don't think that's that's at all clear. So in the absence of any convincing reason to believe it's true, I I don't really see how it it undermines belief in in God. And, And furthermore, even if it is true, well, that still wouldn't tell us very much. If we take the idea of th- these detecting mechanisms for agents, well, the idea is that they're really giving an evolutionary account where religion is a sort of byproduct, at least to some extent, of mechanisms that evolution has, has thrown up. But even if religion is a byproduct of evolutionary mechanisms, well, that doesn't tell us anything about whether it's true or not. And to see this point, Richard Dawkins gives an evolutionary account of morality, where morality is basically a byproduct of evolution as well. But he doesn't think that that morality is irrational or anything like that. Uh, in fact, he, he, he thinks that this is a... I think he describes it as a blessed, precious mistake that occurs in evolutionary history that gives rise to morality. So why is it that that one evolutionary byproduct is such a good thing, morality, and another evolutionary byproduct, religious belief, is such a bad thing? It clearly isn't the evolutionary story that is enabling him to reach that conclusion. He's he's getting that conclusion from somewhere else. Well, that's that's a good point. Now, you explain in the book how how the evolutionary account of belief actually starts to undermine atheism. Can you sort of unfold that? Yes, I'll I'll, I'll do my best. There are a number of versions of this this kind of argument. So one version of this is due to C.S. Lewis, who argues that if atheism is true, then we have no reason to believe that our reasoning mechanisms 
give us the truth and so no reason to believe that atheism is true. Perhaps the, the best version of, of this kind of argument is, is due to Alvin Plantinga in, in what he calls the evolutionary argument against naturalism. And he refers actually to Darwin in a letter that Darwin wrote. Darwin makes the, the similar point. It's become known as Darwin's doubt. And the basic idea of Darwin's was that if we have evolved from the lower animals by a, an unguided process, then why should we trust our uh, reasoning faculties at all. Now, Plantinga spells this argument out in, in quite a bit of, of detail. And his basic conclusion is that the atheist has reasons to doubt all his beliefs, including atheism itself. The way he gets to this conclusion, uh, again, if you'll bear with me, I'll, I'll try to, to just say a little bit about this. It's basically a question about how belief influences behaviour. So let's suppose I, I see a tiger and I run away from it. Well, what's actually going on here? From a, a naturalist point of view, there's some event that's going on in my brain, some neurophysiological event of some kind. But there's also the content of my belief that I, I see a tiger. So we've got these two things, the event going on in my brain, but also the content of the belief, the event and content. Now, what causes my behaviour to run away? Well, it's the event going on in the brain. And Plantinga argues that from a naturalist point of view, there's no reason to think that the, the content of my belief should match up with the, the event. Um, there's no reason to think that uh, my beliefs have any role to play. What's important from an evolutionary point of view is that the right mechanisms are going on in my brain so that I run away. My beliefs actually don't come into the picture. Um, and so what's crucial for adaptive behavior is are these mechanisms in my brain, these events taking place? And if that's the case, then th there's no reason to think that our, our beliefs are, are actually true. So this is Plantinga's argument uh, at any rate, or at least a very brief sketch of it. And if he's right about this, then it, it means that we, we really should be sceptical about all our beliefs if, if evolutionary naturalism is true. So they're basically saying that if naturalism or atheism is true, uh, our thoughts are just the byproduct of um, an untrustable uh, evolutionary process. Uh, it doesn't guarantee, there's no reason that it guarantees truth, so we can never really be certain of our belief or trust our own reasoning to bring us to atheism. That, yeah, enough. that's exactly right. Yeah. So, so now some people may hear that and then they'll say, okay, well, but... You know, here we are. Uh, we wouldn't be here if our thinking wasn't reliable. Uh, we wouldn't have <laughs> lasted this long, but here we are. So our thinking was reliable. Now, I don't know. Maybe is are they missing the point uh, with that sort of response, or where does that um, sort of answer fall short? Do you think? Well, yeah, I think I think that's a it's a very good question. And I, I think there is something odd about the argument, not necessarily in the logic of the argument, but it is it is very hard to deny that our, our beliefs are reliable, however they, they manage to get that way. But Plantinga has an alternative version of the argument that I refer to in the book as well. And the alternative version runs something like this. He says, well, let's suppose that they are reliable. Well, well, then, what's the chances of that if, if naturalism is true? How did they get that way? And so one way of putting this would be to say, well, there are two explanations for the reliability of these cognitive mechanisms in our, in our brains. One is the naturalistic one, but on the naturalistic account, there's no good reason for, for thinking that they're reliable. But if there's a God, if we've been created by God, then it's very plausible to think that he would have created us with reliable cognitive mechanisms. So the best explanation for the reliability of our reasoning is that we're created by God. And th this way of looking at the argument fits in with the overall approach that I take in the book, where there are various features of the universe and of our existence that make much more sense in terms of belief in God than they, they do in terms of atheism. Mm. 
you know, in thinking about it, it to me it, it seems like you have to maybe approach the issue with the unbeliever with that comparison, like say, okay, we're looking at atheism or theism, which per, which gives a better explanation of this? Because you know, if you if you don't specify that, maybe they just beg the question in favor of of evolution. Well, we we're here, you know. Uh, it had to be evolution was successful in in giving us truth, you know. Um, so maybe that uh, best explanation approach is the ideal one, maybe. Well, yeah, I I, I think so. I, I think it's a good way of looking at it because we're we're not saying that um, that that naturalism. Uh, that naturalists can't offer any kinds of explanations. Uh, clearly, they, just like Christians, can appeal to science for giving explanations. But when we take a step back from, from science and look at some of these more general features of the universe and of our existence, well, what is the best explanation? And I think... Um, I think I find this a helpful way to go about trying to, to make a case for belief in God. All right. Well, let's move on to one of the areas of your interest being probability. Uh, and you mentioned how Dawkins uh, makes the claim that there's almost certainly no God. Now, can you briefly lay out how he can say that and, and his reasons for that and maybe where you see that uh, argument falling short? Okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll try to, to give an overview of it. His basic idea is to start with the design argument. And Dawkins' view is really that there's some initial plausibility to the design argument. He, he's made the claim in the past that before Darwin came along, uh, design seemed to be seemed to be a very good explanation, or at least it, it, it seemed to be plausible. Uh, but it was Darwin, really, who destroyed the argument for design. Now, I, I think this is, is mistaken for a number of reasons, one of which is that when we look at the modern design arguments appealing to fine-tuning, well, Darwinism has no relevance here. But one of the, the central claims then that, that Richard Dawkins makes on, on this kind of argument and on design arguments generally is that we, we start off by trying to explain something complex like life, something that, that stands in need of explanation. And the reason that we, we try to explain it, he will say, is because it's so improbable that, that complex life would have come about by chance that we need some kind of, of explanation for it. So when we appeal to, to God, though, he will say, but, but God is even more improbable than whatever it was we were trying to explain in the first place. And the reason for this, he, he will say, is because a God who's capable of doing all the things God is supposed to be able to do must be incredibly complex. Now, this argument fails, I, I think, for multiple reasons. Um, let me mention, I, I suppose, one of the, the main ones. I, I think the, the main objection to it is exactly how Dawkins links the notion of complexity with improbable. The idea is that if something is very complex, it must be very improbable. But in fact, really what his argument at best shows is that something that comes into existence by chance and is very complex, well, the probability of that is very low. But of course, nobody thinks that God came into existence by chance or indeed in any other way. So I, I think uh, th there's a problem straight away there. But this also relates to the question as to whether God is complex. I mean, Dawkins claims that if God exists, he must be very complex. But when we think of the kind of complexity we're talking about here, it, it's what he has referred to as organized complexity. Uh, and it really is the idea that something is, is made up of a, a lot of interacting parts, a lot of different components. And the, the difficulty here is that there's just no reason to think that God is, is like that. I mean, what are the parts that God is, is made up of? Why would God be, be so improbable? And uh, he, he doesn't really spell out any reason for this. He, he basically appeals to intuitions here. Um, now, the question as to whether God is complex or not, 
I mean, that's one that theologians and philosophers will discuss at length here. But the basic point that I'm making is that even if God is complex in some sense, he doesn't have this kind of organized complexity that Dawkins claims he does, uh, or at least there's no good reason to think that that's the case. But perhaps I can make one final point about this. Sure. If, even if we granted that Dawkins' argument is successful, really all it would show would be that God's existence is highly improbable before we take all the relevant evidence into account. And one of the things we know from, from probability, and it, it's, it's a sort of trivial point, really, something that's very improbable before we take the evidence into account can be very highly probable once we've taken all the evidence into account. And a simple example that I give in the book is, uh, let's suppose that uh, you enter the, the lottery every week, and uh, on a particular week, then I'm asked what the chances are that you've you've won. Well, on any given week, the chances that you've won the lottery are, of course, highly improbable. It's very unlikely indeed that you, you've won. But suppose that you uh, phone me up and you tell me that you've won, and then I see your, you in the paper and on the news and TV all telling the same story about you having won the lottery. Well, in that case, with all this evidence, then it's it's very probable indeed. In fact, it's it's certain almost that you, you have won the lottery. And so I, I think Dawkins' argument, even if it were successful to show that God's existence is improbable, we would at best have the conclusion that it's improbable before we take all the evidence into account. And, of course, Dawkins will claim that he has taken the evidence into account in terms of fine-tuning and so forth. But I, I think when you look at the details of his arguments, that just doesn't really stand up to scrutiny. Mm. Well, very good. Now, you further take apart a whole variety of new atheist arguments from Dawkins to uh, Dennett to Hitchens. Um, but what sort of, in shifting gears here just a bit, talk to Christians who are interacting with atheists these days, whether it's colleagues at work or friends on Facebook. Would you have any advice that you'd want to share to them or um, advise them and really how to uh, approach others when you know they're interacting face-to-face or online? Yeah, that's a, a great question. I, I think one of the things that I would advise, first of all, would be to, to know what you believe yourself. Um, I think we need to be prepared as Christians to give an answer for our beliefs and to explain what we, we do believe. And so I, I think this would be the first point that I would want to emphasize. I think some people are perhaps daunted at the idea of giving reasons for their beliefs. But I, I think we have to start where we're at and, and try to explain our beliefs as, as best we can. I, a second point, I suppose, would be to, to know what other people believe. And th- this one's actually pretty easy because all we have to do is to ask other people what, what they believe and uh, we, we can all do that. So I, I think finding out what other people believe and where they're coming from is a, a very important aspect of all of this as well. And I, I suppose maybe one more point that I, I would mention, maybe this is the most important of, of all, is just to remember what the focus is. As Christians, we believe that the very purpose of, of life for all human beings is that they would come to know God and that God has made this possible because Jesus died for us. So it's really not all about winning an argument. Um, it's really all about this message of Christianity, the, the good news that we have to offer to other people. And so I think we've got to keep the focus right that it, it's not always worth pursuing the the argument if it's not leading us anywhere. We've got to remember what the the point of it all is. Hmm, Very good. Well, you know, your book takes apart the arguments in an academically rigorous way. But a lot of times, you know, we get the impression that what we're dealing with sometimes with some of the those who are sort of bent on this new atheism is that there's a lot of hurt or emotion or somehow anger there. So what's been your experience on that note? And what about encouraging people to kind of bear that in mind when they're interacting? 
Yeah, that's, that's a good question. I, I think a lot of factors can come into play. Uh, our, our beliefs, uh, and this goes for all of us, not just atheists or new atheists, but those of us who are Christians as well. Our, our beliefs are, are shaped by not just the evidence and rational factors, but our experiences and uh, our entire life history, I suppose. So I, I think we've got to bear that in mind when we're discussing these kinds of things. And, and you're right, uh, various there can be various aspects to that in terms of anger and uh, hurt and so forth. And I think we just need to start where people are at and, and be aware that these factors might might be present. I, I think in terms of the new atheism, there, there is a, an anger sometimes displayed that they, they really want to portray our beliefs as being completely crazy, uh, beliefs that no rational person could take seriously. And, and one of the tactics that is used to, to achieve this is, is ridicule. And the, the new atheists are very effective at this, I must say. Uh, you know, belief in God is compared with the flying spaghetti monster or the tooth fairy or whatever it happens to be. And although this can be effective as a strategy, I think we've got to be aware that that's what it is. It, it doesn't amount to an argument of any kind. And we've got to be aware of, of that sort of thing. Um, I, I think we, we also should, should bear in mind that sometimes when people are criticizing our beliefs, well, perhaps it's just because they're repeating what they've, they've heard elsewhere, or it could be due to some of these other factors. And again, we, we just need to, to treat people where they're at at that time. That, and one of the, the ways of doing this is to ask people about their beliefs again, to, to find out what they believe and in particular why they believe it. Good stuff there. Now, well, there's one more thing I want to make sure that I point people to, and that's your website, um, Saints and Skeptics. Can you talk about it and where people can find it? Okay. Uh, yeah, Saints and Skeptics, this is something that we've just set up recently. Uh, we've been working on this for a while, but we've, we've just launched the website recently to, to coincide with the release of the, the book as well. The, the idea of Saints and Skeptics is to use rational persuasion to communicate the central claims of Christianity and to try to encourage and equip the church to deal with some of the, the kinds of issues we've been talking about and some of the questions that, that skeptics might have. The, the website is www.saintsandskeptics.org and there you will find uh, various articles or, or ideas really to provide resources that could be used by Christians um, and should be of interest to people who are not Christians, hopefully, as well. Uh, and these come at a range of levels from uh, quick thoughts, uh, just giving some brief ideas on, on some particular subject to much more detailed articles as well. Uh, they'll cover various topics, including the existence of God, science and faith, evidence relating to the historical Jesus. Uh, we have talks, some talks available as well uh, on the website and book reviews too. So this is something we're hoping to develop over time. And uh, one of the things I should say about the talks, actually, uh, Graham Veal, who's also involved in, in Science and Skeptics, is, is a school teacher and some of the resources he has made available might be of interest to um, high school students uh, or indeed teachers perhaps as well. Well, very good. Now, I want to definitely point people uh, your way for the saintsandskeptics.org website and to your book, Atheism's New Clothes. So, David, I, I appreciate you taking the time to do this interview. It's uh, been a real pleasure speaking with you. You're very welcome. Thank you very much for having me, Brian, and I hope you continue to do the excellent work that you're doing with Apologetics 315. I've been speaking with David Glass author of Atheism's New Clothes, Exploring and Exposing the Claims of the New Atheists. Links to his books, as well as the Saints and Skeptics website, can be found at today's blog post at Apologetics 315. I want to take just a moment to thank you for listening to this podcast, and if you are a regular follower of Apologetics 315, I'd like to point you to our Facebook page. If you like Apologetics 315 on Facebook, you'll just get one update a day with a link to today's blog post, and you'll be able to interact with others who are fans. And if you follow on Twitter, you'll get tweets with some of the best links to Apologetics resources throughout the week. I'd also like to ask you for your support for Apologetics 315 as we continue to grow as a ministry. 
We are now a non-profit organization and our growth depends upon the regular donations of listeners like you. Our goal is to provide free quality resources consistently in order to grow the next generation of Christian apologists. Would you help support this ministry? If so, you can click on the support tab at Apologetics 315 for more information. If you'd like to listen to other podcasts by Apologetics 315, just search in iTunes for a variety of other resources. Would you like to hear a particular scholar or apologist interviewed? Contact me and let me know at interviews at apologetics315.com. This is Brian Auten, and thanks for listening.